So today we're looking at two virtue ethics and the anthropology of morality. Um, so this piece by Cheryl Mattingly comes about a decade after James Laidlaw's piece that we just looked at. But it's uh, a continuation of anthropologists' efforts to grapple with this question of how it is that we can ethnographically approach questions of ethics. She opens her piece then by noting the critique within anthropology of anthropologists' tendency to equate the moral with the social. Uh, so this is something that we already uh, encountered in Laidlaw when he was discussing Durkheim. Uh, and this, she also agrees, leads to a shallow understanding of the moral. Simultaneously, she thinks, anthropologists have disavowed the, quote, autonomous individual who can choose her own moral destiny, while at the same time, anthropological debates seem to converge on, quote, a strong agreement that at least some aspects of moral life need to be connected to freedom of moral self-making and moral choices. So there's some tension here. And partly the rest of her essay is going to be dedicated to uh, unpacking or, or disentangling what some of this tension is about and how we might move uh, toward a more robust theoretical approach to an anthropology of ethics. There remains, Mattingly says, a central theoretical problem. If you want both to account for local moralities, so against this sort of modern impulse to universalize morality, say morality is the same everywhere, and also question the unfreedom position, we encountered that somewhat with Laidlaw already, the we could say the Durkheimian approach that has this very mechanistic notion of ethics and morality such that we individuals, we don't act independently of the social forces upon us, but rather we are kind of enactments of the collective moral disposition. So then, um, if you want to account for local moralities and the unfreedom position um, that claims that individuals have no moral agency. Well, where do you turn? So we got one answer from Laidlaw with Nietzsche, Bernard Williams, and Foucault. Uh, Mattingly is going to offer a somewhat different approach. Not incompatible necessarily, but distinctive. She suggests a turn to virtue ethics. So a pre-modern orientation to moral practice that takes morality to be, she says, closely bound up with everyday practices of self-cultivation, the elaboration of spe specific technologies of moral development, and insistence on the ne necessity of developing a virtuous character that has the, uh, as the basis for moral action in everyday political and social life. She sees then an overlap between virtue ethics understanding of the moral in relation to practices of cultivating virtue and anthropological understandings of the moral as learned and negotiated socially. So for example, in the family, that would be uh, perhaps the um, most instinctively satisfying place to look for the cultivation of morality. How do parents teach their kids to be moral? So then what we find is that where other moral philosophies consider ethics or morality in abstractions, again, we, we saw this with Laidlaw's account of Kant, um, virtue ethics, like anthropology, locates them in social and cultural worlds. They are a matter of social practice, in other words. An important point of access to ethical ancient ethical practice and philosophy for anthropologists has been, of course, Michel Foucault, also a figure we're revisiting from Laidlaw's piece. So an important part of Foucault's later work attended to self-cultivation and uh, uh, as a moral project among ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, which played an important role in the development of his ethics of self-care, his being Foucault. 
Mattingly sees then two variants of virtue ethics. One she calls the first person or the humanist, the other the post-structural or post-structuralist, which hold different promise for an anthropology of ethics. So she starts off though with what they share and then will later turn to how they differ. They both critique moral universals, like an Archimedean or God's eye point of view from which one could derive moral reasoning rules or procedures. Uh, we could imagine uh, Kant's moral philosophy, the ontology, occupying this kind of position where the application of reason will lead us faithfully to correct moral conclusions about how we should act, which principles we should follow and why. So instead, virtue ethics take the moral to be historically and socially conditioned. By extension, she says, the moral in any society is dependent upon the cultivation of virtues that are developed in and through social practices. The moral is centrally bound up with practices of self-care and self-cultivation. It is not captured by espoused beliefs, but rather involves the emotions, the body, everyday activity. So again, we get this idea that simply enumerating a number of moral rules, as you would find in scripture, is just not going to do the trick for her. She, she thinks that virtue ethics offers a much more promising start exactly because they are so embedded in the social worlds of their practitioners. These two uh, virtue ethics share further the principle that the moral is a pervasive communal enterprise. So it's not down simply to an individual and there's no kind of exemption. Nobody is outside the moral. It's the product of communities that generate and mold, she writes, the technologies of virtue and the aspirations about the good life to which individuals ascribe. Now, beyond rejecting the Enlightenment moral philosophies associated with secular humanism, so we've already covered that with deontology, but also utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism, uh, we're not going to talk much about that, but it can be captured with this idea of the greatest good for the greatest number. So that what is good is what brings, uh, sorry, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So what is good is what brings the most happiness or the most well-being to the greatest number of people. Um, a later version of this is called consequentialism, where you could say the good is derived from the consequences of one's acts. And so hopefully, even though that's a very, very sketchy way of putting it, you can see how it's distinct from Kant, where the good is derived from these principles of the categorical imperative, autonomy, and acting out of duty to the law. So these are quite different. But these are the two that sort of dominate secular humanism. And uh, I think it's fair to say they continue to. So beyond rejecting those philosophies, these two models of virtue ethics place ethics within practice, not in abstractions, in practice and allow for moral freedom and creativity and so they also reject the unfreedom position the say Durkheimian position in which our moral lives are determined uh, and not susceptible to choices to be clear Durkheim is not the only one that uh, produces an unfreedom position there are others as well um, but he's the one who we encountered with Laidlaw that's why I refer to him we can see the points of contact between the approaches, right? And these are what get most emphasis in anthropology, in large part because the participant observation, um, that the, the methodology that underlies most anthropology, it lends itself to this. This methodology, participant observation, the tendency to use life histories and the descriptive models anthropologists often employ in ethnographies of moral life, all these things, they lend themselves to representation of the moral in first person terms, 
right? You, that you can uh, capture a moral ethos through the story of a particular individual, for example. But anthropologists also remain attentive to the ways that large-scale institutions and historical fo forces shape individuals' choices, adoption of subject positions, and so forth. So that there, there's an attentiveness to the way that we are within history, that we don't sort of exist outside of history, looking at it and deciding where to insert ourselves, but rather we are, we are captured within the histories in which we live and that they shape us in significant ways. So then, why does Mattingly insist on a distinction between first-person and post-structural approaches to virtue ethics? Well, her concern is that we're prone to under-theorizing first-person moral perspectives. Part of the rediscovery of Aristotle, who is the uh, touchstone of virtue ethics in the 20th century, arose from a dissatisfaction with mechanistic explanations of human action. Again, there are, there are those like Laidlaw who uh, put such an accusation toward people like Durkheim or functionalists who followed in his wake. And they pushed to consider human action in terms of intentions and consequences, which presumes first person agents with reasons, desires, and some sort of end toward which they organize their action. So all of these things then are um, appealing features for the neo-Aristotelian or neo-virtue ethicists, if you will. An enduring conviction of this neo-Aristotelianism, if that's not too much of a mouthful, is that human existence entails process, right? So that again, we're not getting um, the kind of abstract principles of morality that you would find with someone like Kant or the sort of calculation of the good that you find with utilitarianism where you, you add up how much good is um, the product of a particular action and then you can determine uh, whether, whether it's better than another course of action. Rather, they're invested in human life as processual. So then human life is not just some set of qualities, just not just some agglomeration of qualities, but is processes of becoming, that it has potentiality and possibilities. We could maybe hear a, a, a little bit of an echo of Laidlaw here. If what we're looking at are processes of becoming, of becoming the kind of person I would want to be, let's say, then there is implicit in that a notion of freedom, right? Some kind of freedom to strive toward some kind of becoming better, more like an ideal, whatever the case may be. So then cultivating virtue is the ethical component of these processes and it becomes manifest through our activity. In other words, we're not going to get a virtue ethics that doesn't entail processes, activity, practices, self-cultivation, all these things. And naturally, they're appealing to anthropologists because these are exactly the kinds of things that participant observation allows us to study. Now, two things stand out here to Mattingly. First, the good life is acted, therefore vulnerable to the fragility and uncertainty of human action. We're not capable of always performing everything perfectly. Uh, the recent Olympics are an example of how we're continuously striving for better, but there's, there's no such thing as action that's not vulnerable to failure, that's not vulnerable to mistakes that's not vulnerable to just the vicissitudes of chance, of things knocking us off the path that we're trying to go along. Um, and indeed, something like the pandemic could, I think, very straightforwardly be considered something that 
is not part of our control but reveals the vulnerability of human action, of human planning, um, of human striving. So, okay, that's one. Second, Neo-Aristotelians emphasize the ordinary as the main site of moral work. Importantly, the ordinary is not a sanctuary where moral riskiness of human action is suspended. Rather, it is exactly the site of that riskiness. So this goes back to something that I uh, mentioned in the previous lecture about the ordinary. So that the ordinary, uh, or the introduction to the course, the ordinary is not this kind of safe place where uh, nothing bad can happen to us, where everything is predictable, where we're always completely oriented to our surroundings, our lives, and so forth. Rather, the ordinary is, a, is where we pursue those sorts of things, but it's also exactly where they are at risk. Again, because of things like the vulnerability or the fragility of human action, of human speech, of our command of language, and so forth. So then, uh, where was it? Okay, rather it's the site of that riskiness, which we can see in notions of luck or fate that upend our best intentions and derail the projects we were enacting. In the first person traditions, the commitment to practice-based ethics aligns with a kind of humanism in the emphases on, she says, the fragility of life, the sociality of being, meaning our lives are social in nature, and the vulnerability of acting in the face of circumstances out of human control. And again, this goes to the idea that we are always acting within a history that was not our creation, but influences us. And so uh, our, um, our actions, our speech, our practices, our plans, our projects, all of these things are vulnerable to forces that are much greater than we can individually conceive in their entirety. Nevertheless, and this is the humanism part, we are left to solve those problems that we encounter. We're left to deal with those vulnerabilities on our own. That the invocation of things like gods might be a temptation, but that ultimately we wind up having to resolve these things on our own. That's the nature of the kind of humanism that, that uh, first person um, virtue ethics is uh, participating in. So then <clears throat> she says the first person aspect of humanist virtue eth ethics has two senses. One has to do with our throneness. That's what I was just talking about. Our throneness in the world, which is to say that reality presents itself to us as something out there only through our own engagement with it. This in turn presumes a, a self to have first person access to one's own experiential life. The, the notion of a self is baked right in, in other words. If we don't have an idea of the self, we don't have an idea of who or what it is who's experiencing these things, who or what it is who's engaging with this thrownness into the world. The second way that uh, humanist virtue ethics is first person has to do with the primacy of the first person, either as the singular I or as the plural intersubjective we. In this sense, uh, I'll just flag this, we'll come back to it in, in a couple of lectures. Vina Das is going to have uh, some things to say about this um, first person play between I and we. I'll dwell on that more when we get to her piece. I just want to flag it on the way by. In this sense then, this first person sense, perception itself requires, she says, an enduring individual who experiences. The cultivation of your character depends on this enduring self. If, if you can't depend on some notion of a self that endures, there's nothing there to cultivate. There's, there's no self 
to try and make better. So you have to have this enduring self with narrative and biographical integrity. Humanist virtue ethics then appears in ethnographies in various ways, especially in works that focus on singularities and exigencies of practical judgment and the moral struggles involved in inhabiting one's everyday life and ordinary ethics where the moral involves the exercise of practical judgment about the best good, so not the ideal, but the, uh, the best good within the particularities of circumstances. Now, this notion of ordinary ethics is something uh, we'll see more explicitly engaged in Vina Das's work and, uh, and in some of the supplementary readings, if you look into those. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to bracket that for a later discussion. What I want mostly to hang on to here is that Mattingly is uh, promoting the notion that humanist virtue, virtue ethics is tied to this idea of ordinary ethics. That, that ethics is not something that exists in an abstract realm beyond this world or beyond social life, but rather it is intimately integrated into ordinary life. Another place where we find first-person virtue ethics in anthropology is in the phenomenological tradition. So, Phenomenology is initially a, uh, a body or a school of philosophy, and uh, you can capture it uh, very briefly in, in this little statement that I've um, reproduced here. Phenomenology is the study of structures of consciousness as experienced from the first person point of view. The central structure of an experience is its intentionality. It's being directed towards something as an experience of or about some object. So that uh, how I experience the world through my senses say, that is a phenomenological question. How the world comes to be meaningful to me through the experiences that I have. These are phenomenological questions. Such an approach in anthropology insists on prioritizing people's own commitments and understandings of their situations in ethnographic accounts. So then the eth ethnographer in these cases is not trying to say, here are the practices, here are the rituals uh, that these people under undertook and here's what they mean. Rather, th they might do that, but then also if they're phenomenologically inclined, they'll say, here is how the participants in these rituals and in these practices understood what they were doing so that it's those self-understandings that are at the heart of phenomenological anthropological accounts. Mattingly characterizes her posture toward humanist virtue ethics in this way. I'm suggesting that the moral frameworks developed within first-person humanist virtue ethics offer a rich vocabulary for considering humans as self-interpreting moral beings whose perceptions, interpretations, and actions help shape moral subjectivities in the singular as well as the collective. The humanist model of virtue ethics is, however, not the only one. So uh, she wants to turn from this to the post-structuralist model uh, because there are aside from being important points of contact, are important distinctions. The post-structural apprehension of virtue ethics stresses the, quote, pedagogical nature of becoming a certain sort of ethical subject. So what does that mean? It means that um, there is instruction involved in becoming a certain kind of ethical subject. And this kind of instruction if you look at Foucault's work, for example, can involve forms of disciplining, as an example, uh, to create the kind of uh, bodies and subjects that fit the mold of the ethical subject. 
so uh, become a certain sort of ethical subject which implies striving to occupy a subject position. There's this notion then that there are particular kinds of subject positions available almost as if say laid out on a menu or a template and you strive toward those that exist within this uh, menu of, of options and that that takes a kind of training to attain so that you are working toward an end that already exists in, in some sense, however ethereal that sense may be. In that, in that way, it's teleological. The ethical end toward which one strives is defined in advance. It's not something that you're discovering or creating as you go. It's already there, and then you're striving toward that ideal. You're striving for a predefined subject position. This is, this is what the post-structural uh, thrust is. Virtue ethics in this sense involves the reproduction of an ethical regime involving training in self-care practices that take place within predefined ethical models of life, modes of life, excuse me. We might start to think here that mm, this sounds an awful lot like the unfreedom position that we've heard so much about already because it doesn't sound like there's a great deal of freedom in what you pursue or how you pursue it. It sounds like the structures in which you have your social life are guiding you in particular directions. It might not quite sound Durkheimian or, or functionalist, but it doesn't sound very free at this moment. An implication of the notion of self-cultivation as striving to occupy a subject position is that the self that humanist virtue ethics takes as given as a starting point is in the post-structuralist view an effect, not a cause. So that the subject position is the product of the training that you go through. And you only attain a notion of self insofar as you can occupy a subject position. If you can't attain the subject position, there's a sense in which you're not a fully constituted self. And so the post-structuralist position here is distinctive from the humanist position that we've just heard described. The, the notion of I, or a subject, is the creation of historical and cultural conditions of which ethical regimes and normative technologies would be a part. The I is a product then, not the thing that you start with that strives toward an end of some sort, but rather the end is the I that is produced through training, through techniques, techniques of the self. Citing Nicholas Rose, who Nicholas Rose is uh, a pretty well known uh, uh, say inheritor of Foucauldian uh, methods and Foucauldian thinking. So this is why she cites him. Citing Nicholas Rose, Mattingly describes on the one hand the death of the self, the, the self as this sort of self-actualizing entity that was so central to humanist virtue ethics and to the persistence of the same notions of self but as regulatory practices that govern individuals. So now the notion of self is, uh, it's, it's a kind of a disciplining technology, if you will, rather than some kind of pre-existing entity on which social forces might try to act. So if you think about the notion of responsibility, um, the way that it has play in uh, current American uh, discussions, then or say say within criminology, the way that the idea of responsibility figures there, then you get a self who is supposed to be responsible, but the idea of responsibility with respect to the self there is a regulating practice or a regulatory practice. This is the kind of thing that Rose is pointing toward, that if you don't 
accept responsibility, you face consequences. In fact, though, when you do accept responsibility, you expect you wind up taking the consequences of that responsibility as well. So that there's a way that you're in this kind of double bind that the regulatory practice is going to generate a subject position that you're going to wind up occupying and that is where the self emerges rather than the self being something that exists and then uh, gets funneled in some way or another as it strives toward uh, the end of responsibility or some, something along those lines. It's through such governing of individuals that we arrive at ideas and feelings of selfhood. Ideas and feelings of selfhood are products then, they're effects, they're not causes. Hopefully this is uh, pretty clear already that these are quite distinct notions of how virtue ethics, how one would enact virtue ethics and what they do, what they produce. We find in virtue ethics these two genealogies, two genealogies of the self, excuse me. The humanist self at the origin of the cultivation of virtue through practices of self-care and the post-structural self that is the end product of these practices. Not very compatible in that, in that respect. The post-structuralists uh, stress, the post-structural stress on genealogy aims to get at, quote, how truths, subjectivities, notions of meaning are produced in any historical period through various social practices, that is, through forms of institutional governance, through the discourse of experts, through the training of bodies, through the organization of temporal and physical space. In the genealogical sense, then, the self is not a stable, timeless feature of human individuals, but is a historically, socially specific product of social practices. Social structures, in this view, hold a dominant place in the shaping of the moral. Recall what, um, what Laidlaw had to say about agency and why agency wouldn't do the work that he wanted it to do when discussing freedom. It's the same kind of emphasis on social structures that we're getting in the post-structural uh, elaboration of virtue ethics in Mattingly's piece. It's no surprise that anthropologists who draw on post-structural traditions focus on, quote, the shared practices, technologies, and discourses that form ethical subjectivity. This focus presumes that personal ethical subjectivity can largely be explained by these powerful pre-existing moral codes and practices. Again, I think the echo of Laidlaw is quite strong here. Mattingly captures her sense of the post-structural approach to the moral in this long passage. I'm splitting it into to, so it's going to continue on the next slide. Even when moral, practice, uh, moral experience is taken as a serious topic of consideration, ordinary practical life tends to be treated as tacit enactment or reproduction of cultural norms. Right. So then here, ordinary life is just sort of the acting out of pre-existing social scripts, in a sense. Continuing. The moral, in other words, tends to be treated as a codified system embedded in an established habitus, and the ethical, by contrast, can include experiences and practices of transgression and critique of moral codes. An emphasis upon the repressive tendencies of the moral and a related skepticism about the ordinary as a site of ethical and social possibilities is a, is a position very compatible with the entire trajectory of Foucault's work, where ordinary life is so often portrayed as a space of confinement and everyday moral work becomes a kind of moral subjugation, which amounts essentially to processes of normalization or subject creation 
via mechanisms of biopower. So there's an important sense in which uh, normalization and the ordinary are um, seen as overlapping in a lot of Foucault's work and in a lot of the work of those who have adopted Foucault. One of the things that Mattingly is trying to do is maintain some separation between the ordinary and normalization. Uh, normalization carries with it this sense of the imposition of norms on the members of a community. The ordinary is, uh, in, in certain views, views that I think Mattingly uh, would endorse and that we'll come across later, is also the possibility for resisting normalization. If you take that approach, we'll see that in Das's work in particular, I think, then the ordinary and the normal or normalization don't overlap in the same way at all. They become, in fact, uh, friction exists between them as a result. Let me continue them. Conveniently, the Codian scheme allows anthropologists to continue to emphasize the moral ordinary as a space of unfreedom, even while introducing notions of power and subjugation, a critique of the moral ordinary that were not part of the earlier Durkheimian tradition. Mattingly is not really persuaded that this provides a good place for an anthropology of morality to start. To, so her criticism is not that this is under-theorized. She thinks that the first-person views of, um, of virtue ethics are within anthropology under-theorized. That's not an issue with the Foucauldian uh, position or the post-structural position. There she has a different, uh, a different critique, a different beef. To begin with, Foucauldian-inspired virtue ethics has a hard time discerning, she says, the complexities of motive, of moral deliberation, and moral creativity, especially as elements of ordinary life. And sometimes it simply dismiss, dismisses them. Now, again, I just want to flag this on the way by. We can already see here how she's taking the ordinary as the possibility for creativity, the possibility for moral deliberation, and the realm in which the complexities of motive exist. And so she thinks those things, though, are neglected by the post-structural approach. Foucauldian approaches can sideline experience and the singular self, singular self, again, that is something that's going to be important when we get to Das's work, and have a hard time accounting for human-propelled personal or political transformation. She writes, without a strong theory of the subject as agent capable of acting upon history, even if within a history that also makes her, again, we should hear an echo of Laidlaw here saying, promoting the idea that freedom is not the absence of coercive powers, but rather freedom is enacted within the context of the pressures of the social, within the context of the exercise of power on you. Okay, so um, even if that history also makes her, then we as scholars are not sufficiently equipped to contribute to a conversation about social change. She captures the implication of this by pointing out that if we take the ordinary to offer no resources for critique or transformation, then social change can only happen through radical breaches from the ordinary or by heroic transgressions. And she worries that this leaves us either with nihilism or with elitism, as, as if a, a vanguard can be the only agent in history or as if there can be no agents in history, and sort of all is despair. But we might also ask if we can, in fact, find examples of the ordinary providing moral resources for social transformation. 
This is something we'll come back to in future readings. As you might guess uh, from the way that I posed the question, those readings are going to say, yes, we can find examples of this. And it's, and it's worth tracking these examples to understand how it is that the ordinary provides these sorts of resources for free action, transformation, um, intervention in history, and so forth. Mattingly concludes that because anthropologists tend to favor the social and structural, again, should hear an echo of Laidlaw here, and because post-structuralisms dominate anthropological scholarship, quote, first-person perspectives will continue to be swallowed up with, within what are essentially third-person explanatory frameworks. Humanist virtue ethics, she thinks, offer an alternative by maintaining the first person's perspective as one possibility for moral agency and experience. She does not dismiss the post-structural position. So that's not her purpose here, is to say that we have to abandon the post-structural position. That's not it. What she wants to do is draw out a distinction between these two approaches to virtue ethics to say that there is uh, something in the post-structural theorization that neglects what the first person virtue ethics has to offer. In her view, it provides useful tools, first person or humanist virtue ethics that is, it provides useful tools for looking at particular moral traditions and the very various day-to-day -day technologies of self-care that people draw upon to cultivate or try to cultivate virtuous characters. One might say that it is especially helpful in looking at the training practices of communities that are intended specifically for the cultivation of character and the moral transformation of self. It also provides tools for seeing how moral technologies of self-care are from other perspectives, like post-structural perspectives, tools of subjugation to regimes of power. As she has explained, it's not good at and sometimes hostile to considering post-structural virtue ethics is not good at and is sometimes hostile to considering first, pers first person perspectives on individual struggles to realize best goods in individuals singular circumstances. It, it's a bit, it, it's like it's tone deaf to these things. This, of course, is where humanist virtue ethics is stronger. It is focused not only upon the practices of moral sub subjectivation involved in cultivating uh, virtues. It is also equally focused upon the problem of action itself with the doing of ordinary life. So there's an, in, there's an important reversal here where the post-structural, um, those working in the post-structural vein will be more inclined to think of ordinary life as doing too, as the one that shapes actors uh, by offering subjects, subject positions that they will then strive to occupy. Here, she's sort of, Mattingly is sort of recovering the ordinary by talking about the doing of ordinary life, that this is, that there are individuals who do ordinary life, that it is constituted through the action practices and so forth of individuals. Carrying on. And action occurs in a world in which the moral good is often challenging to discern and more challenging to achieve. The humanist tradition of virtue ethics maintains attentiveness to how people try to live lives for which they are somehow responsible, even as it is in many ways out of their control. Again, this idea of the vulnerability of human action. I would include in that the vulnerability of, of human speech, that these things um, are part and parcel of this striving within circumstances that are not completely certain. 
The approach she advocates then must both describe inherited moral traditions, because of course we don't act in uh, a moral or ethical vacuum, um, moral traditions and practices of subjugation. Why? Because our inherited moral traditions uh, will in some ways act as pressures upon us to behave in certain ways. Uh, whether they are just uh, trying to push for a certain kind of conformity of us or if they are trying to shape us into particular sorts of moral beings is a question that I leave open for now. So, okay, let me go back then. Um, must both describe inherited moral traditions and practices of subjugation and processes of ethical judgment connected to singular events in the particularity of selves formation given their specific historicity. What we should be able to see then is that we're starting to get um, a few different kinds of anthropological positions shaping up. They're not strictly at odds with each other. They don't perfectly overlap with one another, but they can start attuning us to the sorts of things that we should pay attention to as we do field work so that we can look at large scale uh, institutions and events and forces to try and understand how it is that they impinge on individuals lives and how individuals are put in a position of simply having to figure out how to deal with the circumstances they're given that are not entirely of their own creation but at the same time and this is what Mattingly is pushing for we can also remain attentive to the singularity of individuals' lives. That, that lives are not, or in individuals' lives, are not simply things that we can swap out one for the other as if they're all identical. So the singularity will help reveal how it is that people take on the sorts of vulnerabilities and fragilities of life, especially within the context of the pandemic, and strive within those circumstances to become certain sorts of people, to recover the ordinary, which, which we might gloss as recovering uh, access to context, because this is the way in which we can make sense of our actions, of other ac others' actions, and how to move forward in the world. And that's exactly what becomes vulnerable to disruption, um, to disorientation, through all kinds of different social forces. But the one that, that occupies us here is uh, those that arise with the pandemic. Okay, so that is the end of this. Next, we're going to move on to <coughs> Webb Keen's piece. It's quite a, 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 it's a substantially longer piece of writing so give yourselves time to, uh, to read it thoroughly and uh, we will pick up with his takes on how to pursue uh, virtue ethics. Um, again, adopting a kind of Foucauldian approach that's not quite the one that we've seen here, but um, is not entirely divorced from it either. But I leave that to the next lecture. Okay, thank you.